Sydney and Miami, and also fellow at the seminar at Austria. Next uh, panelist is Professor Dr. Hasin Taj. Dr. Hasin Taj, Madam, is presently serving as professor and dean faculty of education at Bangalore University. She has total of 36 years of teaching since 1986. She is a university gold medalist in her MED course. She is a state and national awards for excellence in research. She has done book reviews, published for 230 research and thematic articles in journals of national and international standard and repute. She has had seven PhD and uh, MPhils. She has completed six projects funded by national agencies like UGC, ICSSR, MHRD, and state governments, etc. She attended the HRD facility. First panelist is Professor Dr. G. R. Jagdish. Presently, he is serving as the principal of National Law College, Shumaga. He has served as in charge vice chancellor of Karnataka State Law University in 2013 in the capacity of dean. He was chairman of expert committee of government of Karnataka to recommend unaided law colleges for grants in 2013. He drafted grant in aid code for 19 aided law colleges to verify and recommend to the government of Karnataka the requirement of grants for other unaided colleges. He also drafted proposal for establishment of directorate of legal education in the state. He served as dean of law at Kuwempu University and Karnataka State Law University. He holds expertise in teaching constitutional law, administrative law, family law, panchayat raj institutions for graduation and post graduation levels. He guided more than 20 dissertations for PG students. He served as chairman, local inspection committee for affiliation, Kuwempu University and Karnataka State Law University, board of postgraduate studies at Karnataka State Law University, board of studies at Kuwempu and KSLU. Board of Examiners at Kuwempu University and Karnataka State University. He also served as academic council member and ex official member of Kuwempu University and Karnataka State University. He authored four books, At the entire education sector is taken for granted. We are giving you policy, you bloody well obey it. I therefore I had requested the uh, my friend Malukarja that I will speak on two three aspects. Three aspects are the first one is that am I qualified to speak on national education policy? Number one. And therefore, I had requested Manoj not to introduce me, but I'll introduce myself. The second aspect is what is given by principal sir to me about the regulatory institutions. But then my opinion about it is quite critical and therefore it may not take much time. The third one is overall assessment of the new education policy. These three components I talked about. First thing is. But when I look at the members of the policy planning body, national education policy, I was perplexed that except Professor Kamath, who was a vice chancellor of SNDT and who has some presence in, I, I very responsibly say this, some presence in the field of education, because I go by Google Scholar. Google Scholar recognizes scholars in the area of that subject. And the recognition is 19, one nine. As against some of the educationists in India, like Professor Govinda, a Karnataka man, has a recognition of 2,580 Google Scholar citation. The rest of the members neither have taught at school level, nor had been connected strongly other than being vice chancellor or something with framing of anything called education. The, the issue comes that when a policy has to be framed, policy has to be framed by people who have been experienced in all the 
areas of education from primary school education till the higher education the first one is for that matter that i had uh, i taught from 1979 till 88 in the when somebody speaks in between i'll keep myself mute therefore <laughs> i request balikarjan yes sir that please instruct people those who are speaking in between hmm, shall be muted yes we, we have been we have been doing this uh, right sir right sir the i was teaching in the primary school government primary school in nagarbavi from 1978 to 88 and from 98 98 onwards every saturday i go play with the children and try experiment my teaching methodology the pedagogy in this school my children from the first two three batches are now the people who have been placed many places a school which started with 27 children is now about 120 we have a new building etc the second thing is i taught in the college during the early years taught at the university level in gokhale institute taught at phd level in uh, institute for social and economic change taught uh, headed many uh, bodies in the ugc and committees in the ugc try to frame the things and then finally as far as policy is concerned making a policy is a technical subject in fact there is a theory of policy making which is taught at saskatchewan institute of policy planning where i was a visiting professor now what is a policy i i i must state that this particular policy is not a policy it's a wish list of some people who wanted to have something done and they had put entire wish list into the thing including the institutions that they have recommended i'll come to that hall laswell jordan coleman oecd policy document policy making mechanism document professor rao vikar vi rao professor goinda professor vargis maulana abul kalam azad professor nigwekar and i can list out many people who have said what is a policy and how a policy has to be made what is the gist of it gist of it is a policy aims at specific often quantifiable objectives there are no quantifiable objectives in the new education policy deploy an array of instruments array of instruments to achieve these objectives and operate according to the pre planned framework prime minister modi has been uh, talking the other day he he was talking and very minutely he said that we have a document but where is ranniti where is the strategy we have to have ranniti strategy instruments and then timeline he gave four aspects he didn't want to criticize his own policy but then indirectly he said that these are absent indirectly and you can you can hear his interview on youtube therefore the uh, policy has to take into consideration first identification of the problems prioritizing the problem areas prioritizing the solutions making a vision which will cover the prioritized area brainstorming the solutions with experts and the last stage is drafting and circulating for a feedback these stages were absent and therefore what has been there has been an half hearted attempt to give a shopping list that this should be done that should be done that should be done no doubt we had had experience earlier in fact all of you may remember that when there was a you and cry about mar uh, dismantling ugc and making ichr etc etc yashpal committee report together there was a un cry it was quite a few years back nothing happened after that because the 
shift or change is something which is difficult and it has to be gradual unfortunately this policy doesn't recognize that shift or change is gradual and not sudden shock the vision that this policy makes is wonderful in fact it says that we have to transform india into bharat and the uh, the seed is taken from not from india not from bharat seed for the policy is taken from the sustainable development goal number 4 which has been framed by outsiders indians were not a participant in sdg 4 so we follow something which is from abroad and it's not that india does not have the similar kind of things in our ethos policy repeatedly says we have to re establish indian ethos but repeatedly goes out of indian ethos i feel that this is not fair this is not fair what is fair is that if i am talking indian ethos i must be committed to it and that commitment should be reflected in every sentence that i make i would not have enough time but then i would say that the problems made out by the uh, policy document is fragmentation they say multi disciplinarity while introducing me manoj said that uh, sorry sorry uh, not manoj uh, patil patil said that i have been awarded an award in uh, agriculture policy i have been uh, given jeevan gaurav puraskar in agriculture economics did i learn agriculture economics ever in my life i don't have a land i have not seen bullocks i have not seen plow i don't have any land no plow forget about it i never sat in a class of agriculture economics i never knew anything about agriculture multidisciplinarity does not come by forcing from top it comes from intuition from inside and therefore the policy actually did not recognize what is uh, most required in the uh, in the entirety in the methods of learning and teaching the policy should have recognized that the methods of education are constructivist methods you allow the constructivist you allow the collaborations between children and children you allow the collaboration between teacher and the children you allow the integration between teacher children and children and children you allow reflective learning you allow inquiry and you allow the innovation based learning where did i learn agriculture i learned agriculture when i was going loafing around i used the word loafing around the entire village and trying to investigate into things that's exactly my school the uh, hasin taj madam is there and this particular document makes use of the word pedagogy and pedagogical almost 80 times <laughs> not knowing very well that the word pedagogy comes from pedag which is a greek word meant boy children and pedagogy is used in the original form not in the mutated form pedagogy is used in the original form from the greek language it's pedos pedos is a boy child teaching a boy child behavior is pedagogy boy child i'm not a child and therefore when it comes to teaching methodology as far as school is concerned pedagogy pedagogical was fine but then what they are talking about is quality and quality is andragogy yotagogy and these are the methods of teaching at higher education schools again they have gone into curriculum many times they speak about curriculum and this curriculum is something which is i call it as choral or padak choral or padak 
Corolla paddock are the enclosures for horses in the horse rearing fields. These are simple bamboos tied around and the horses are left inside. Horses feel that we are tied. We are given a border and we are not supposed to go out of the border. Actually, the horse has the strength to break the bamboo and or to go over the bamboo and graze anywhere. But then horse brain is only to be enclosed in that enclosure, what is called paddock or corral. Our curricular curriculum and the boss, the boss is the boss of everything. Boss is board of studies. In fact, we restrict the knowledge boundaries by giving the syllabus and the curriculum. Do not allow the child to learn anything outside it. The teacher also feels, and during February, March, if you meet the teacher or the student, syllabus has to be completed. Syllabus has to end. Well, we are appointed in order to inculcate knowledge, not to complete the syllabus. And we forget that. Inculcating knowledge is the basic theme of, or should have been the basic theme of this education policy. Now coming to the uh, Malikarjan had given me, but you speak about the institution. And when I was talking to Mrs. Vaidya, I told, I, I wrote some time back in EPW, long back, about creating development sinecures. Many of us and many of the participants may not know the word sinecures. Sinecure is a redundant institution. Sinecure is a redundant institution, creating an institution like in Pune, even today, the Panshet, uh, Panshet Dam, Dam broke in 1967. Panshet Dam Rehabilitation Office is existing even today. In Hyderabad, the office of the enemy property, many people may not know what is enemy property. The property of the people who left India for Pakistan. This office of the enemy property even today exists in Hyderabad after the partition, 647, after the takeover of Hyderabad Nizam state. This is, this is called sinecure, redundant institution. In fact, the new education policy focused more on redundant institutions. How many institutions that they have made? I listed out very roughly. Actually, there are four only. But if you go into nitty gritties in the policy and check every sentence out, there are 50 new institutional structures that the uh, new, new education policy recommended. The first one is board of assessment, which will assess at the school level, the central advisory board of education, the central advisory board of education, the digital infrastructure and knowledge society, the general education council, the higher education commission of India, HECI, the Higher Education Grants Council of India. And very interesting thing. And this is how I say that this policy, those who have written policy, and I have great respect for Professor Kasuringan and uh, our, our friend M.K. Sridhar. Where are they sleeping? Because in the policy statement, they say MHRD will be named as Ministry of Education. Go to MHRD site. Open MHRD site in your uh, computer right away, and you'll see that it is written already there. Ministry of Education. It's already functioning as Ministry of Education. So, what does that mean in the policy that you make it Ministry of Education? I am I am perplexed that highly educated, highly informed people do not know that on the MHRD website. It is called Ministry of Education only. Then comes the NAC, NAC, not NAAC. There is a redundant, there is an institution which is right away in Nagar Bhavi called NAC. And NAC accreditation is a nightmare for many colleges. 
I had been visiting 78 colleges. I have visited as NAC chairman, and about seven, eight universities evaluated, accredited as NAC member and chairman. I find that NAC is a dipotswa. When we go to the accreditation, they put lamps, lights, curtains, chairs, tables, everything, and sometimes even rent it in. There was a smart classroom which was shown to us. We have five, six classrooms, Mumbai, no, Mumbai uh, College. Which are these five, six classrooms? I went and looked into it. I said, "Who teaches in this classroom? Please call the teacher." Teachers came. and i said can you take a lesson and the fellow was not able to do anything then finally he said sir kal hi aaya hai ye kal hi aaya hai so this is nac and the new nac national accreditation council which is not naac then this is eighth institution ninth is national curriculum framework the framework will be framed by somebody else then national higher education regulatory council under one there is an accreditation council there is a regulatory council then parak parak is something which features in the new education policy and parak is performance assessment review analysis and analysis of knowledge for and parak ends at kh k h holistic development development is missing in the abbreviation and therefore we are not serious about development what are we serious about performance assessment review analysis of knowledge for holistic full stop the development is not there in the abbreviation then we have s c e r t state uh, education councils we have s q double a f the school quality assessment and development framework we have national research foundation we have higher education grants council totally 15 institutions which have been featuring in various lines in the national education policy we already have ichr ihr icssr ugc ict these that and all that Now what happens is that the NEP has recommended some of the clubbing of the institutions, and the major recommendation comes of clubbing of AICT and UGC. Forgetting that the two operate on totally different platforms; they are not similar platforms. I have worked with both, and they are on different platforms. The quality of education is one of the themes. with the national education policy which follows unfortunately on the quality aspect of the national education the nep has been more or less silent nep has not taken note of the problems that confront the uh, confront the education field and these are from the nupa national institute of education it's a university for education only what is that the size of the classrooms in which the students are filled in two technology three parent education four facilities like toilet 14 18% of the schools do not have approachable roads 14% of the schools do not have girls toilets what are we talking about quality apart from that political interference is one of the things which anybody in education field will say it has become a joke in fact somebody asked me sir you write vice chancellery ka rasta so what is the road to vice chancellery the road to vice chancellery goes from colleague an mla known to you or member of parliament known to you and from then onwards it begins i was on seven universities and i have confronted these people very significantly and i had a rambard being ram i had my bond my rambard was if the mla or mp or minister's office 
phone call comes i will say good sir you have recommended please write a letter and send it to me i will do it the fellow he puts his uh, foot in the mouth does not want to write the letter but wants to bring an oral pressure on to me this has happened in andhra pradesh when usmani university was to which is selected vice chancellor and we did not select the person which they wanted they scrapped the search committee reappointed search committee and appointed the vice chancellor whom they wanted to become a vice chancellor this is the quality of education we are talking about and politicization of education is absolutely not talked about politicization of education is an institutional evil and since you have asked me to talk about the institution i end at that the institutional evils that we have in the country are the ones which we need to curb thank you 22 minutes <laughs> yes sir um Th thank you desh pandey sir for your uh, critical appraisal of the nep and uh, about uh, the new institutions which have been identified and were going to be established for implementing this policy and uh, also your view on how the nep uh, has one minute one minute manoj one yes, small sir. point which i forgot and this i am uh, placing before uh, malik arjuna sir Yes, because i'm speaking in the law college in front of law faculty in front of people who have a uh, strong knowledge of constitution education is on the concurrent list at the point 25 it's an item 25 on the concurrent list what is the meaning of concurrent list concurrent list has a meaning that in case of dispute between the state and the center on a particular policy or on a particular aspect in education the state regulations if passed earlier shall prevail otherwise it will go to the council of states now as far as nep is concerned the first insult was not taking it as a concurrent uh, list not not recognizing and respecting it on concurrent list but taking in the union list forcibly without the knowledge of the state or without the concurrence of the state it is on the concurrent list and should have been on that thank you yes thank you sir thank you for a uh, critical view about how the central government has uh, taken up this uh, new education policy 2020 and uh, how it is not in tune with the constitutional provisions and also you emphasized on how the nep has not addressed the uh, issue of uh, politicizing the education as such thank you sir thank you very much sir. now we'll move on to the next presentation by professor dr jivan kumar sir uh, professor jivan kumar sir would be addressing us on research and multidisciplinary education under new education policy uh, jivan kumar sir Sporting. Am I am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can my can my screen be seen also? Yes, sir. Sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good morning to all of you. I am grateful to Dr. Malik Arjun, principal of the uh, Kelly Law College, and his uh, team for inviting me to be a panelist uh, at this uh, webinar. Uh, my theme has been uh, uh, specifically identified since the NEP, a new economic policy, is a huge document. Uh, I've been asked to restrict myself to multidisciplinary education and research. and therefore i have come prepared with a powerpoint presentation uh, i'll be focusing restricting myself to the area that has been given to me areas that have been given to me multidisciplinary research education and research uh, but when i move to my uh, areas of concern i'll begin with a few broad areas of concern and then i will restrict myself once again to 
the theme that has been given to me. So uh, uh, let me begin with what this document is telling us uh, as far as uh, current problems are concerned. Uh, and the current problems I've identified from this document with specific reference to multidisciplinary education and research. There are five big problems that have been identified uh, as far as these areas are concerned in this document. Uh, for example, they speak of a severely fragmented higher educational ecosystem. They speak of a rigid separation of disciplines. Uh, they speak of early specialization and streaming of students into narrow areas of study. They say there is hardly any emphasis on research. And then they point out to the lack of competitive peer-reviewed research funding across disciplines. This is what you find in this document uh, as far as multidisciplinary education and research are concerned. There are many other problems that are identified in the other parts of the report. And for those of you who may not have seen the report, these are five specific problems identified in this document, the New Economic Policy 2020 document, as far as current problems with reference to, particularly multidisciplinary education and research, which are the areas given to me uh, to be uh, areas given to me to focus upon. Uh, so, if you're, if one is looking at these particular areas, one has to look at part two of this document, uh, and part two deals entirely with higher education. And uh, the reference in chapter 11 is important here because this chapter, which I've read very carefully, says uh, that the NEP is looking at more holistic and multidisciplinary education. Uh, this chapter begins with a policy vision, and this also I'm sharing with you. For those of you who have not read the report, I think it's important to put it in context. And this policy vision has five specific areas. Uh, pertaining again to multidisciplinary education, it says moving towards a higher educational system consisting of large multidisciplinary universities and colleges. Uh, the policy intends to move the system towards a more multidisciplinary undergraduate education. They speak of, the vision speaks of career progression based on teaching, research and service, establishment of an NRF, National Research Foundation, to fund outstanding peer review research and the fifth part of the policy vision speaks of active to actively seed research in universities and colleges. So there's a vision, uh, uh, policy vision, as far as chapter 11 is concerned, as far as higher education is concerned. And uh, if this is uh, understood by us, we may be able to look at the recommendations that you find in this document from a clearer, get a clearer picture of these recommendations. A look at the very first recommendation. This policy document intends to end the fragmentation of higher education. And please note that the, uh, in, the, in the current problems, they mentioned that there is a fragmentation of higher education that has been happening all this while. So they're saying this fragmentation should be ended. And how does this policy propose to end this fragmentation by transforming HEIs into large, and, and this term, these terms are very important, into large multidisciplinary universities, colleges, and higher education institution clusters or knowledge hubs. So uh, this, uh, this is a terminologic, terminological shift which you are seeing in the new education policy. And this begins with the end of the fragmentation of higher education. Why is this policy so keen on ending this fragmentation of higher education? Uh, look at the four or five uh, objectives behind, uh, sorry, not objectives, the outcomes of, the, of this kind of fragmentation. Uh, number one, it would help vibrant, help build vibrant communities of scholars and peers. It would uh, break down harmful silos, that compartmentalization that we've seen so far. It would enable students to become well-rounded across disciplines. And these disciplines include artistic, creative, and analytic subjects. It also includes sports. Uh, another outcome would be the development of active research communities across disciplines. They're also speaking of cross-disciplinary research. And then finally, this objective is also, this outcome is also important. It would increase resource efficiency, material resource efficiency, human resource efficiency across the whole spread of higher education. This is also important for us to keep in mind at the very beginning because they say once the fragmentation of higher education is ended, then all these objectives would be realized. I move to a few other recommendations 
that you find in this document pertaining in a higher education chapter, but specific reference to multidisciplinary universities, multidisciplinary education and research. Now, talking to this term that they're using here, multidisciplinary universities and HEI clusters, they say that this is the highest recommendation of this policy because that's the structure of higher education that this policy intends to create. There's a reference frequently in this chapter to ancient Indian universities and the reference to Takshashila, to Nalanda, to Vallabhi, to Vikramshila and so on. Uh, frequent reference now and then in this chapter you find because they say that these were great Indian universities of the ancient period and these universities are very successful universities and a, a major hallmark of these universities was, was that they engaged in multidisciplinary research and teaching. They're saying uh, this policy document says India urgently needs to bring back this great Indian tradition and, uh, in order to create well-rounded individuals, in order to create innovative individuals. Well, to do all this, what exactly uh, is this policy talking about? What is it? What is the policy recommending? They're saying that this vision of higher education will require a new conceptual perception, a new conceptual understanding of what, like, what actually constitutes an, an, an AGI, a higher education institution. It could be a university or it should be a college. And they define this. This is what a university is supposed to be. They break up universities into two categories. Uh, they say at the, at the higher level, there would be research intensive universities. Slightly below that, there would be teaching intensive universities, and then they come to AC, autonomous degree granting colleges. Uh, they break up uh, the higher education sector into three categories. Please also keep this in mind. Research intensive universities at the, at the apex, uh, slightly below that, teaching intensive universities, and then auton autonomous color uh, exclusive uh, categories. They're saying with, with in course of time, uh, the autonomous colleges could evolve into becoming a teaching intensive university and from a teaching intensive university uh, that it could evolve into becoming a research intensive university and so on. So although they use this terminology, they're not saying these are rigid exclusive uh, categories. Uh, they are along a, a continuum and they would like to see institutions evolving from a slightly lower level to a higher, to, to, to a, to a higher level. There are also targets that have been specified in this policy. They're saying by 2040, all these HEIs shall aim to become multidisciplinary institutions for optimal use of infrastructure and so on. But if 2040 uh, is, a, is a fairly long way off, they're saying firstly, all these institutions should become multidisciplinary by 2030. And then with the increase of student intake and so on, they would be probably ready by 2040 uh, to convert themselves entirely into multidisciplinary uh, institutions. Uh, they say that by, but by 2030, at least one large multidisciplinary higher education institution should be established in every district or at least near every district. Now, this document also says that there's this objective. The GER at present is around 26, 27%. Uh, this should be raised to 50% by 2035. These are statistics, uh, uh, targets which you also may like to keep in mind. Uh, please also note this point that is being recommended in the policy document. Single stream HEIs will be phased out over time. We'll come back to this and as a law college, I'm sure you will be already concerned about this recommendation of the new economic policy. Law colleges are single stream higher education institutions. They don't want uh, such single stream HEIs anymore. Now, all uh, single stream HEIs will move toward becoming vibrant multidisciplinary institutions or parts of vibrant multidisciplinary HEI clusters. Why are they doing all of this? I think it, uh, it's, it's, it's given here. I won't read every line. You can just read it yourselves and I'll move on to something, something more important. In the next section, in the same section on higher education, uh, this document speaks of more holistic and multidisciplinary education. So they're using terms holistic, multidisciplinary, and, and so on. Again, as I said earlier, there's a reference to Takshashila, reference to Nalanda, that the, that the fact that there's a long tradition of the kind of learning that these ancient institutions, uh, universities were uh, imparting to its students. There's a specific reference to ancient literary works such as Banavatas, Kadambari. They say a good education is knowledge of the 64 kalas, 64 arts. And what were the 64 arts <coughs> all about? Uh, uh, some examples I've given here, it could be scientific, like chemistry, mathematics. The 64 arts could be <coughs> vocational fields, carpentry, clothes making. They could be professional fields, medicine, engineering. 
they could also deal with soft skills. So uh, the, re the reference in the document to Takshashila Nalanda and so on says, uh, or to Banabhattas, uh, Banabhattas uh, Kadambari is saying that in the ancient period, good education it was, was multidisciplinary in nature and it uh, was spread over a, a whole range of areas. And this is the kind of <coughs> education that the NEP wants us to get back to. Uh, what exactly are they talking about? Why this kind of holistic multidisciplinary education? Well, it would aim to develop all capacities of human beings. The present system of compartmentalized education uh, is not doing this. Uh, all capacities includes intellectual, aesthetic, social, physical, emotional, moral, and all of these in an integrated manner. If education can do this, well, it would create, it would develop well-rounded individuals. And this is what the 21st century expects from our young people across arts, humanities, languages, sciences, social sciences, professional, technical, vocational fields. We require well-rounded individuals who have been who have been taught a variety of of the arts that have been specified earlier earlier in addition to that they will also be taught an ethic of social engagement they will be taught soft skills communication discussion debate and they would also be allowed to rigorously specialize in a chosen field field or field so look at the terminology look at how carefully the nep has looked at this whole area of multidisciplinary uh, multidisciplinary education there's also a reference in this document to the 21st century and specifically the fourth industrial revolution, the age of artificial intelligence, which we're currently in. And it's saying that, that this is what we have to, this is how we have to prepare our youngsters for. Uh, they're also saying that engineering institutions and even IITs and so on, all of these uh, will have to move by the time frame that is specified towards holistic education towards multidisciplinary education. And if these engineering and IITs are not uh, offering arts and humanities subjects, but they're saying this should be done. So students of arts and humanities, while they are learning science subjects, uh, those from <clears throat> science subjects will also learn arts and humanities. So uh, all these things you find uh, in this document, uh, moving across to pedagogy and uh, uh, pedagogy and multidisciplinary education, uh, this point has been emphasized uh, that communication, discussion, debate, research, opportunities for cross-disciplinary interdisciplinary inter thinking, all of this will be, will be, will be uh, part of the entire exercise. And uh, they're talking about establishment of departments where these departments do not exist already. Languages, literature, music, philosophy, Indology, art, dance, theater, education, all of these are to be established in each of these multidisciplinary uh, in institution. So it's a huge uh, canvas that they're talking about. Uh, they're talking about cr credit-based courses. They're talking about projects, community engagement service. They're talking about environment education, talking about value-based education. Look at areas that environment education is supposed to cover. Look at the areas that value-based education is supposed to cover. The emphasis on human values. Uh, they've all been all been indicated here community service is not to be left out so the whole range of multidisciplinary education as you can make out uh, is to create a citizen who would be uh, not only a good citizen of the country he would also be a good global citizen and uh, in order to equip uh, such uh, in order to create such students uh, they are to be they are to be uh, provided with the opportunities internships local industries businesses and so on research internships etc etc uh, moving across to research what is the nep uh, what is the document talking about in terms of research <clears throat> they're speaking of a robust ecosystem of research changes occurring in the world today requires us to research in the realms of some, some examples are given here, climate change, population dynamics and management, biotechnology, the digital marketplace, artificial intelligence, and they also bring in the current scenario of epidemics and pandemics. So research must be done in all these, all these areas. The criticality of research, they're saying, is more than ever needed today, and therefore, uh, more investment needs to be done on research. The policy is conscious of the fact that as a percentage of the GDP, uh, India is lagging very far behind. The statistic that the document itself uh, gives is 0.69% of our GDP. Uh, that's the kind of investment we've done in research so far, uh, as compared to 2.8 in the US or 4.3 in Israel, 4.2 South South Korea. Well, this has to obviously obviously go up. Another point, as far as the uh, as far as research is concerned, is the establishment of an NRF, National Research Foundation, and they're saying that the, the byline of this organization reads as follows: catalyzing quality academic research in all fields through a new 
NRF. So it's a new body among the many bodies that Professor Deshpande referred to. The NRF is another such body uh, that the NEP intends to create. It will competitively fund research in all disciplines. I also give you the primary functions of the NRF, one, two, three, and four. You can quickly run through that. With the remaining time that I, that I have, I'd like to quickly move into uh, my critical concerns as far as the NEP 2020 is concerned. I have a fairly long list of critical concerns. I hope I have the time to go through all of them. I think I have about five to seven minutes left from the time allotted to me. In case I'm not able to do justice to all of them, perhaps you could uh, ask me to clarify during the discussion time. Uh, I have more than 10 critical concerns. Let me see how many of them I'm able to cover. Uh, this is my first critical concern as far as the document is concerned, where I'm saying that uh, the new economy, the, sorry, the new education policy does not address the critical challenges in education. Why am I saying this? According to me, the NEP has failed to identify and address the critical socioeconomic challenges that have prevented, that have come in the way of India's education, educational progress. The cost of quality education has been has been rising very steep, uh, steeply. At the same time, uh, steeply at the very at the same time, there's an increasing numbers of uh, students are dropping out of the higher education institutions. In addition to uh, critical challenges, I bring in uh, the decline of scientific temper. Uh, I begin. I, I refer to civic values facing vicious attacks. I refer to the social political environment actively promoting obscurantism deepening social divisions, encouraging backlash against the already marginalized sections of society. Now, these, according to me, are the critical challenges before our society, which education, any education policy needs to address. And they're talking about 21st century and a lot of challenges of the 21st century. But where are these critical socio-economic challenges? Uh, when you find a reference to these challenges in the NEP, I'm very disappointed as far as the NEP is concerned. This is my first critical concern. As far as my second critical concern is concerned, I'm saying that there is no clarity on the challenges facing access, equity, and social justice in higher education. If you, could, if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the recent documents pertaining to higher education, you will notice, especially when Professor Thorat was the chairman of the UGC, you will see how much of reference uh, Professor Thorat, how much of focus Professor Thorat was able to give to these three very important terms in higher education. Uh, namely access, equity, and social justice. And, I, and, and, and I'm amazed that these terms hardly figure uh, in the NEP, especially in the section on higher education. The NEP observes that unevenness in access to higher education and inequitable conditions obtained from uneven regional development. Where they make a reference to this, they say this is, this, this is because of uneven regional development. And therefore, they think that if we establish more and more HEIs in backward districts and more districts, the aspirational districts, perhaps this will be taken care of. But I'm not convinced about that argument. I think that uneven regional development is not the sole factor that determines lack of access, lack of equity, lack of social justice. Uh, I am very clear uh, that if there is if 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 there's uneven regional development today, that's because of the huge social divisions that we continue have to have in this country, which education has not been able to address to. And I'm talking about social divisions based on caste, gender, class, disability, religious religious identity, and so on and so forth. This is my second area of critical concern where I say the NEP has hardly spoken about how this is to be addressed. Now, my third critical concern reads as follows. The NEP is silent on impact of social divisions on educational needs and prospects. From the second one, I, I, I'm li linking it up to education here. And I'm saying that the NEP has maintained an unnerving silence, a dishonest silence on how social divisions impinge on the educational needs and prospects of those sections that are already marginalized. Uh, this aspect should have been brought out in the policy. Again, I find it strangely very silent on this. And I'm saying in the second point here, the NEP does not address the challenges in implementing the reservation policy and admissions and appointments. It does not address institutional interventions in discriminatory situations. We have been reading about students from certain sections committing suicide in HEIs and so on and so forth. There is no reference to institutional justice for students as well as teachers belonging to marginalized sections. There's no reference to the accommodation needs of students with disabilities. Uh, these are, I think, major omissions in the, in the new economic policy. So as far as these challenges are concerned, uh, I am disappointed with the new economic policies, area of third critical area of concern. 
uh, in my fourthly, I'm saying that the whole document is highly ambitious. Uh, if it's, of course, if it's implemented in its true spirit, it may perhaps lead to a complete overhaul of the existing education landscape of the country. Uh, but then uh, implementing this hugely ambitious document uh, is, is, is the, lies the crux of the matter. And if you look at the uh, past uh, story of, of, of well-sounding, nice-sounding policy documents, we have so many of them. You can look them up in the website, the Government of India website, too. Uh, any number of good policy documents. But if you look at what have these policy documents achieved, have those objectives been achieved? Well, I'm saying this the last point here, seldom have the lofty objectives specified in ambitious policy documents made significant changes on the ground. What is my fifth area of critical concern? I think here we have to compare. This is what I think Manoj did at the beginning. It's very important that we compare this document, the present NEP, NEP 2020, with two earlier committees that the same regime uh, you know, was uh, was in power. The Subramaniam Committee's report 2016. We need to take a look at the highlights of of this committee's report. We also need to take a look at the Kasturi Rangan committee's report 2019. And uh, when you do this, when you look at these three documents uh, side by side and look at uh, these documents very perceptively, I think one point very clearly comes out. Uh, neither of these, two of these two committees spoke about something which this NEP is more or less very clearly stating. And I have no hesitation in stating here that the NEP 2020 is clearly influenced by the twin ideologies of number one, neoliberalism, and number two, cultural nationalism. I don't have time to go into detail. Let me quickly run through my uh, other uh, critical concern. During discussion time, we can probably come back to this. It appears to me uh, that this is a please all document. Dr. Uh, Dr. Deshpande very aptly referred to this as a, as a wish list, something that, uh, that, that, that uh, a lot of people's uh, good intentions have come into this document. I am using this term, a please all document. It is tried to please so many sections of people, but while trying to do so, I think a lot of, lot of uh, lags, a lot of deficits are very clearly visible in the document. It says all the right things. If you if you read very carefully, you feel you you you, you know you feel that the right things are being said. You know, but it also tries to cover it tries to cover all bases, but it's missing out on critical issues. Just two or three of them are highlighting here. Uh, the need to go back to Takshashila and Alandan so are very important. Okay, that that was a, a glorious a glorious past, uh, but should be not. Uh, look at building a better, uh, uh, you know, uh, an equally glorious future. And is this all that they have to tell us, given the challenges I've already identified uh, in my concerns one, two, and three? Uh, is this is this how they think a glorious a glorious future can be established? Uh, there's a frequent reference to meritoc meritocracy in the in this document. As a public system, nobody will say meritocracy should not be followed, especially in education. But to me, as important as meritocracy is, we also need to emphasize equal opportunity, need to emphasize equity. Another serious lag is integration of how, how, how is this document going to integrate technology and pedagogy. A seventh one, I come here now to the multidisciplinary focus. Uh, how exactly does this document propose to integrate the arts with the sciences? It sounds nice. You know, you, you're creating well-rounded people. You're getting them to art students to be exposed science and so on. Now, this kind of integration uh, is not very easy to do. And my last point here I'm stating, uh, if, you're, if you're asking an undergraduate student to combine, uh, he's interested in rural sociology, but you insist that he has, must, do, must do something else in the sciences also. And if quantum physics is being thrust down his throat, because this is the innovation that his policy is talking about, well, would a student of rural sociology be able to digest what quantum physics is talking about because that the multidisciplinary expects that from him? Eighthly, I'm stating that we already have, perhaps not in the form in which the NEP is talking about, but we already have multidisciplinarity in the existing system that we have. Under the CBSE system, for example, UG students are expected to undertake compulsory language components. They're expected to take up open electives. Even when they come to the postgraduate level at universities, we insist on their taking open electives from completely different departments, completely different disciplines. So we already have something, something of this particular kind. Uh, but in the true spirit of multidisciplinarity, I'm also uh, surprised that in the recent policy decisions of the government of India, uh, what are the, uh, you know, the, the reference to women's studies, program women's 
studies, Centers for Studies of Social Exclusion, one of Professor Thorat's uh, uh, brainchilds, which has done amazing work. Well, there, there, there's, a, there's a systematic, uh, you know, doing away of these institutions. So one side, multidisciplinarity, uh, one side, uh, talking about the need for uh, students to look at a variety of areas, uh, but then these areas, uh, seem to have come under a dark shadow. And ninthly, I'm stating that it's undesirable to phase out single stream HEIs. And this is where I think law colleges like uh, Cayley Law College should be uh, very concerned. Uh, very clearly, the document says in this chapter 11, that all single stream HEIs over a period of time must be phased out. Uh, and those single stream HEIs offering professional vocational courses is undesirable. I mean, what kind of language is this? Uh, I, I think this will lead to serious disruption of existing professional education, uh, agriculture, medicine, engineering. Now, these are you know focused areas, focused uh, HEIs are uh, looking at this, even law, even management. Uh, so uh, these serve specialized needs of important sectors that we're not, uh, we, we should not forget. Uh, but this document doesn't seem to appreciate the fact that these specific areas require, require which, which serve specialized needs, uh, require specialized HEIs. So I think it's an undesirable, undesirable to speak of this kind of multidisciplinarity. I think the liberal arts program is simply too packed. Look at what, 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 it, what it includes, and my earlier slides have gone into uh, how much it tries to pack into a liberal arts program. I think this eclecticism is simply impractical. A uh, student is confronted with a bewildering array of academic choices, vocational choices. I think for uh, for the average student uh, to make a uh, to make a choice is not going to be easy. Eleventhly, I'm sp speaking. I'm coming to research here, undergrad research projects. Uh, I, I mean, I, again here, I'm I'm amazed. They're saying uh, if the three-year course can be spread up to uh, four years, uh, those exceptional students in the uh, three-year course they can uh, you know uh, register for doctor research. Uh, I, my views are I express in the second and third points here. Four years of undergrad study can be expect students to develop the maturity and academic expertise required to embark on original research. One or two may be, exceptional cases may be there, but then I don't think this is something that the average undergrad student, even with four years, would be able to do. I come to my second last critical concern. Uh, the, I, we spoke of the NRF. I think it's a top-down model of administering, administering research, and I have this huge difficulty with the top-down models. It's centralized. Uh, it's speaking of administering research initiatives in higher education. It's an apex body. It has authority to decide on research priorities, authority to allocate funding to projects. Uh, I don't think this is the way in which research should actually be, be, be funded. Uh, because uh, because uh, you're, you're, you're leaving out come from regional and from local circumstances are being ignored here. This is my last uh, point. I'm sorry, I'm exceeding my time by a few minutes. This is my last point, and I'd like you.